thank you, and uh, thanks to you and, and uh, the other organizers uh, for, first of all, putting this really very special, very exciting meeting uh, together, and also for uh, inviting uh, me to, to present some of our work. So, um, as I think other speakers have already pointed out, the uh, scope of this meeting has been quite uh, remarkable, very broad, from the notion of uh, probability to um, probability and issues of fundamental problems of probability in quantum mechanics to uh, second law and uh, um, just this afternoon and uh, generic mechanisms of, of uh, generating uh, fat-tailed distribution. So it's really uh, quite humbling for me to, to present to you what, uh, what we have been uh, working on. Uh, it's a more practical question. Uh, the question is how can we use information that emerges from, from various uh, sources of experimentation and combine them with, 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 with models, a classic uh, uh, Bayesian problem. And what is interesting, or what I found interesting about this problem was that that uh, there were questions of ensemble theory that emerged as we were trying to address this question. So to, to start out, uh, uh, Christoph and, and Jakob sent me an email. So uh, I was told to uh, address a general audience, and what better way to address a general audience to introduce the uh, realpolitik Bayesian uh, to you, uh, pointing out uh, the, I think the foundations of, uh, of a Bayesian worldview that there are no knowns. Uh, these are the things we know we know. There are uh, known unknowns. That is to say, we know these are so, there are some things we do not know. And then there are also unknown unknowns. And these are the ones we don't know we don't know. And it is the latter category that tend to be the difficult ones. So I think that sums up the challenge uh, I think many of us are up against uh, in, in, in the big world. And uh, indeed, the unknown unknowns give us the most trouble. So here is a specific problem that uh, we have been interested in for a number of years now. And that is a very broad source of experiments uh, provide us with information of varying quality and level of detail on the structure, the dynamics, the motions of macromolecular systems, and, and uh, specifically uh, uh, proteins and nucleic acids and their assemblies. And here you see one of the systems we're interested in uh, tethering uh, uh, vesicles together for subsequent fusion. And here you see a list of, of, of the experiments. And you can see uh, the known knowns, uh, the, the, uh, known unknowns, uh, which are the, hidden, the parameters, and the unknown unknowns, you cannot see, but we can speculate about them, dealing with inconsistent data, uh, our inability to properly describe uh, this, these experiments and uh, to accumulate the information. So the, the question I will be concerned with is, is um, we, we have all these data, and now we would like to represent uh, our system in terms of an ensemble of molecules of, of this kind in conformation space. So not with a single structure, let's say a folded protein, but with an ensemble of structures. And this could be a polymer, polymeric type. It can be an ensemble of very specific uh, structures. And the challenges that we face in, in, in assembling uh, uh, information from disparate sources is, is, is many. We have data that cover a uh, wide range in, in regards to their statistical as well as systematic uncertainties. And uh, if you combine data with, uh, from different sources, you always have to worry about models of uncertainty of, of, of the error to have a proper balanced description at the end. Uh, it's quite challenging uh, to, to model the data which in this case, case means calculating observables, even given structural models, uh, can be rather difficult. Some of the observations uh, require uh, rather intricate uh, calculations, uh, maybe of a certain higher level of quantum mechanical uh, 
nature, and that can be problematic by itself. And then um, maybe the, the, one of the bigger issues is, is how to represent the model. And the model should account for prior knowledge. We know a lot about uh, protein structures, let's say. There are probably uh, more than 100,000 structures uh, of, of proteins that have been solved at pretty high resolution, near atomic resolution, and, and they are available in the database. But in our case, um, as I already said, the, the, the core challenge is that, that a single structure will not be sufficient to describe uh, all these data. Simultaneously, we know we have dynamics, we have motion in our system, and so we need to represent the state of the system in terms of an ensemble, of a distribution of, of different conformational uh, states. And finally, uh, one problem is, is how to formulate the problem of, of uh, inference of an ensemble in a, in a proper way. We are here at the interface of uh, statistics and statistical mechanics, and uh, as I try to convince you, we are dealing with known unknowns and with unknown unknowns. So the, the main idea for us was to formulate the problem in a, in, in a Bayesian uh, framework, uh, trying to infer the ensemble on the basis of our prior expectations and any data uh, we can get a hold of. And so, but as I said, there's some interesting connection, or at least for me, interesting connection to the theory of ensembles. So uh, let me start out with a bit of background on ensemble theory in statistical mechanics. Of course, this, I think to this audience, in this location, uh, not much has to be said about uh, uh, the concept of ensembles as representing a macro state of, of a system in terms of an ensemble of uh, weighted microstates and uh, for the purpose here, we could think of a probability distribution in a, in a high dimensional, six n dimensional phase space as a representation of, of, of this ensemble. And in the case of the microcanonical ensemble, uh, where all these ensemble members lie on a, a hypersurface of, of constant uh, uh, total energy in a classical uh, world, uh, that is uh, relatively uh, straightforward. It's rather inconvenient uh, in, in kind of uh, computational practice, but, but uh, it's certainly uh, theoretically uh, very well defined. The idea was, and this goes uh, really all the way back to, to Boltzmann, that states of equal energy should have uh, the same probability in, in a closed system. Where things get a bit murkier is already when we want to construct canonical ensembles, and uh, I have made the exercise of going through a number of textbooks and going through these textbooks when the canonical ensemble is derived, there are attempts of making it constructively by uh, looking at integrals over, over shells in, 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 uh, in phase space or to use uh, smarter arguments of counting and then already feeding in ideas of, of, of statistics. But uh, by and large, my impression, and I'm, I'm, uh, I would be happy to hear your feedback on this, by and large, my impression is that most authors of textbooks uh, are very happy when they have introduced uh, the canonical ensemble, that they can finally do something in practice, but uh, the, the construction itself always feels a bit awkward, and that's uh, why uh, uh, Jane's, in part, had, uh, I think, had, had quite an impact uh, by offering a, a, a very direct route, uh, a shortcut, uh, or some might think a sleazy trick uh, to the canonical ensemble uh, that you can um, arrive at, at this uh, beautiful uh, Boltzmann statistics in, in, in just a few lines uh, on... on, on by invoking a, what seems like a rather generic uh, argument. So the, the idea is, again, no introduction needed. We heard about uh, Boltzmann's uh, H or Ada uh, theorem, and we heard about uh, Shannon's information uh, entropy. Uh, and what Jane's uh, uh, shortcut is to, to, to maximize 
uh, an entropy of, of, of the Shannon form under certain constraints of normalization, in the case of a canonical ensemble uh, of a, a total energy as, as a weighted sum of, of the probabilities of the individual ensemble members, P sub i, and then uh, by maximizing this entropy, uh, one readily ends up with a, with a form of, of the probabilities of the individual ensemble members of, of this up to a scaling factor of, of, of the Boltzmann type, and then using some other arguments, one can identify the Lagrange multiplier uh, with, uh, the, with one over uh, the, the temperatures of one over so the reciprocal temperature. So that's uh, uh, very nice. And uh, since, so now we have, we have now most of, of, of what we will need for, for uh, what I will be presenting in the next uh, few minutes. The one missing ingredient is, is, is Bayes' theorem, but uh, uh, since most of you uh, evidently have, have been exposed to uh, Bayes' theorem here at this conference, and many of you are uh, much deeper experts than, than I would ever consider myself. I don't have to say much about Bayes' theorem, just to, to remind everyone the, uh, the, the, the basic, the minimal formulation says something about probabilities of models uh, given, given data uh, and using this, uh, uh, relation for, for conditional probabilities expresses this uh, quantity that one is interested in, in terms of uh, the, the other conditional, the corresponding reverse conditional probability, a probability of data given model, which corresponds to the likelihood function, and then in addition has what's called the, the model prior, so, and uh, as, as, as the closing factor. So, um, since I didn't have to say much about Bayes' theorem to this audience, that gives me uh, a bit more room that uh, to address uh, maybe a, a more profound question, namely, uh, where does this picture come from? And you can find on, on, on Wikipedia. Apparently there is a prize out there. I don't know, uh, it's also a story. Somebody has already claimed the prize. The, the one, apparently, uh, 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 picture that has been promulgated of, of, of uh, uh, Reverend Thomas Bayes, and of course, if one looks, uh, more, at least to my eye, there is a, a quite a remarkable similarity between Jane's and, and, and Bayes, so, so my, I will try to claim the prize that it might actually have been uh, one of Jane's uh, tricks. So with that, back to, the, uh, to, to my story, so let me now formulate our, our problem. So, so the question that I want to tackle is we have from various experiments. Experiments are indexed by uh, uh, I. We have made observations, uh, capital uh, uh, Y, and uh, this is uh, our, our, one of our inputs. And so these observables are calculable, and they are calculable as averages over over an ensemble of distribution. And this ensemble average I express by this integral over configuration space where P of X is the probability density, the normalized probability density in this configuration space. And then the second input is what defines our prior. And the prior is given by some other probability density in configuration space, which in, in my world would typically be a, a computational model, a simulation model, a so-called force field, which defines a potential energy function uh, for the structures in configuration space. And then the question is, what is our best estimate, given these two inputs, uh, of the true probability density P of X in configuration space? Uh, how can we attack that? And so, uh, as I said, we pursue a, a Bayesian uh, route to this uh, uh, problem and represent uh, uh, our uh, solution as a, as, a, as a probability space density. The problem that uh, uh, we ran into is when you deal with uh, densities uh, is that both the prior and the likelihood uh, become functionals because they depend not just on, on, on numbers but they depend on, on, on entire uh, functions, and um, that uh, somewhat complicates 
uh, the matter. And so uh, one way of, of now defining uh, a, a prior uh, is by asking that probability P of X remains close to our uh, reference probability P sub zero of X, and we define closeness in terms of uh, the relative entropy or the callback Leibler divergence with one uh, free parameter that I will get back to later. Uh, this parameter theta expresses our level of confidence in the reference uh, distribution. As it turns out, it has to be chosen, um, and it's difficult to choose it uh, a priori. So the observables, as I already mentioned, are, are ensemble averages, and uh, for the model of the likelihood function for simplicity, uh, we use a, 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 a Gaussian uh, error model. That is, uh, Gaussian errors uh, make the calculation simple, but they're not uh, necessarily limiting uh, the analysis uh, that, that follows very much. So in the simplest form, we will have uncorrelated observations, so just uh, uh, sigma i squared as the errors of, of the individual observables, but later I will uh, uh, consider correlated errors where you have a, a covariance matrix of, of, the, of, the, of the errors. And uh, it's important to keep in mind is that these errors combine uncertainties both in, 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 the, uh, 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 in the data themselves, so in the measurement process, and in our way of calculating the observables, because as I said, it can be quite challenging uh, to, to calculate certain properties, let's say an NMR chemical shift with, with a high uh, degree of accuracy from a structure. So then the likelihood is defined in terms of this uh, chi-square uh, uh, functional uh, in, in the usual way. So what we then uh, end up with is a posterior now that is again a, a functional. It, uh, in, the, in the usual way of, of uh, uh, taking likelihood times uh, prior, uh, this is the form that the posterior takes, takes. So it is a distribution over the space of uh, probability densities in, uh, in this, uh, uh, this three n dimensional space of configurations. And uh, this, I think, is it's itself quite interesting if you think about uh, what, what this means and if this is meaningful, because it would, uh, again, going back to, to James's derivation of, of the canonical ensemble using a Maxent method. Uh, uh, this would be a generalization of that, where you would end up not with one Boltzmann distribution, but with Boltzmann and friends. But uh, we have not uh, explored this any further at this stage, but this is something that uh, you may want to, uh, to keep in mind. So what we did is we, we looked for the, uh, an extremal uh, solution for the, in some sense, uh, which is also interesting, this goes back maybe to the talk we, we heard uh, uh, also this afternoon, what extremal means, but we looked for a, a, a maximum, uh, we ignore the, the measure in this case, of, of this uh, prob probability uh, functional over the space of P of X, uh, and we define this maximum variationally by looking for uh, the variational uh, uh, optimum under the constraint of, of normalization. And that's the solution of this process. So it is optimized distribution is the prior times an exponential. And the arguments of the exponential are the sum over the various observables times the value the observable takes for the uh, particular phase configuration space point x, and then weighted by a uh, difference between the, the uh, uh, the mean value calculated and the mean value actually observed uh, scaled by the variance. So the, the problem with this is, this is a very, fairly nice looking form, but the problem is it's a nonlinear integ integral equation for, for the optimal uh, phase configuration space uh, distribution. So it doesn't seem to be, it's not immediately obvious that uh, how to, to handle this either. But uh, before, uh, discussing ways of sampling from this 
distribution and, and dealing with it. It's just one important point, because I think this is a very nice result, is, and that is if the prior distribution is exact, that is, if the prior distribution already leads to averages that are uh, in full agreement with the experimental observation, we do get back the prior. And this may seem uh, trivial to you, that statistical method, if, 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 the, if the results agree, that it will give back uh, whatever prior you had. Many uh, other ensemble uh, optimization techniques do not do that because they add additional bias on, on whatever input you take. So this was a very a nice result for us. But now back to the problem of, of how do we deal with, with, with this uh, distribution? Uh, how do we solve this uh, um, uh, for, for, the, for the unknowns in the distribution? For that, just to, to, to go through uh, some, uh, 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 some math, we can uh, integrate out all degrees of freedom uh, from our uh, optimal distributions and from our reference distribution except for the observables. So if we have only one observable, this will be a uh, one-dimensional distribution uh, of the observables y. And uh, uh, remember that these are always assumed to be normalized uh, distribution. And uh, what we then recognize is that in this uh, reduced space, or projected out space of observables, uh, actually these distribution take a rather uh, nice looking form where we have uh, the optimal distribution is the reference distribution times an exponential of uh, a sum of the uh, uh, observables, left and right, times some coefficient. And this is this covariance matrix, so which is 1 over sigma squared, uh, if, if you have uncorrelated errors. And these coefficients f, however, uh, they have to be uh, found self-consistently. They are not uh, immediately given as numbers. They have to themselves satisfy a relation. They, that is, the deviation between the averages calculated and the averages observed uh, are what define these generalized forces that act linearly on the observables. The problem is then reduced to finding generalized uh, forces in a self-consistent manner. And uh, I'm not going to uh, explain this in any detail. Uh, if you use generating functions, you can find a uh, relatively uh, compact, uh, explicit expression for the nonlinear equations that these generalized uh, forces have to satisfy. So instead of solving a self-consistency relation, uh, iteratively you can solve linear, nonlinear equations. But what, something that I found more interesting, and again, uh, some, at least to me, was rather unexpected, is that these uh, generalized forces uh, satisfy a relation akin to a mechanical equilibrium. And this is, uh, uh, outlined here. So if we identify the logarithm or minus the logarithm of, of uh, the reference distribution uh, as a free energy surface in the space of observables, so this would be uh, a typical potential of mean force for the statistical mechanicians, we take the gradient with respect to the observables and now average this gradient over the optimized distribution then uh, a few lines of algebra tell us what, what uh, this average is. It's the covariance matrix, or the inverse of the covariance matrix, times these coefficients, these generalized forces. If we perform a similar average now, uh, again over the optimized distribution, but in this case we are averaging the gradient of, of our log likelihood function, or in this case the chi-square, uh, what we find is we have almost the same relation except for, for the, the prefactor of 1 over theta. What that means is that, that the forces that try to restore the reference distribution are in equilibrium, mechanical equilibrium with the forces trying to uh, pull the ensemble towards uh, the observations in, in, in a, in a, in a uh, uh, sense of uh, mean force uh, and, and gradient with respect uh, to 
uh, the, the log likelihood. So I thought it was uh, quite interesting. So now, one thing that uh, uh, you, those of you who have dealt with similar problems in particular, but maybe also others, might wonder is, is this looks an awful lot like a regular maximum entropy method. Is it? And in, I would say in some sense, turns out it is, and in other sense, it, it turns out it is not, because it has, has this, this Bayesian origin, and it leads to certainly differences in interpretation. So let me explain. So in standard maximum entropy methods, we always enforce averages strictly. And I, I always felt I've been using maximum entropy for uh, more than 20 years, and I always thought this was rather awkward, because uh, our observations are never precise. Uh, it's not never 100% accurate, so enforcing something strictly uh, seems, seems a bit odd. But, um, and they're dealt with as Lagrange multipliers, just as in, in, in the Jamesian derivation of the canonical ensemble, beta turns out to be the Lagrange multiplier that uh, conjugate to, to, to the energy. And uh, here, uh, uh, we have, we, our solution takes essentially the same functional form. It is also a linear function in, in our observables, just as it would be in a, in a regular maximum entropy method. But the coefficients, the prefactors, uh, take on different values. In maximum entropy, we impose strict uh, constraints. Here, uh, we, we look for prefactors that are self-consistent, such that you have this balance between uh, restoring uh, the prior and uh, accounting for the data. And so this is uh, illustrated again here up to this uniform uh, scale factor. So there is one maximum entropy formulation, however, that uh, is even closer to, to what we're doing, and that's a very widely used formulation by practitioners in image restoration and many other fields. It goes back to the work of Gall and Daniel, uh, and what they did is they maximize a Shannon entropy under the assumption that chi squared is equal to one exactly. So they do a maximum entropy maximization and the constraint that they impose is that chi squared is equal to one. And when you do that, uh, you end up um, uh, uh, with a formulation that is indeed uh, very similar uh, to, 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 to what uh, uh, we have, and they have a now a notion of uncertainty. They effectively, uh, so chi-square, I should say it is a reduced chi-square, so per, per data point, that means they accept an error of uh, essentially one, one standard deviation as typical. And uh, in our case, this is very similar, but again, it's different because we do not need to make the rather I think awkward assumption that for whatever reason chi-square should be strictly one, because we know in many practical cases that may not even be realizable because your, your estimates of, of the errors are, are off, so you have, uh, or your data, you're further out in the tails. And we can also, in addition, account for non-Gaussian errors. So with that, uh, just a few words on, on uh, some practical issues. How can we uh, uh, construct ensembles according to this uh, optimal distribution accounting for prior um, uh, uh, operation space models plus plus data. Uh, there are uh, really quite a number of ways, again, for uh, those of you familiar with uh, molecular simulations and free energy calculations, it turns out to be very closely related to free energy calculation problems. But uh, the simplest way of, of, of dealing with this problem is, is just a post-factum uh, reweighting of, of representative of a prior ensemble, so not a lot of work is needed. Uh, a more challenging way uh, that can deal also with systems where prior and posterior uh, 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 models of, of how the, the uh, uh, configuration space distribution are, are quite different is to have um, an on-the-fly optimization of the ensemble. And there is the simplest practically used version is to run multiple identical copies of your system in a computer simulation in parallel. Uh, each 
one truly identical, but these copies are now coupled to each other by an additional energy term that is uh, uh, chi-squared times the number of copies uh, divided by some scale factor. So uh, what does this do? Uh, for illustration, to give you an idea of, of uh, uh, what, what the effect of, of this ensemble optimization is, I, I picked one example where we have just one degree of freedom, uh, which is a, a dihedral or torsion angle of, of a molecule with a, a, a linear uh, polymeric molecule, so it's a torsion around the central bond. And, and for simplicity, I assume we have uh, two preferred uh, rotomers, two uh, orientations of, 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 this, uh, of, of this bond. And if we, and the, the magenta surface indicates the, the reference distribution in this space, if we, if the observation says that uh, the preferred angle is, is here on this uh, black vertical axis, and we did a, a, an optimization using certain error, uh, it's relatively small, of assuming that a single structure accounts for this observation, this would very much tighten the distribution in, in angle space uh, uh, to, to account, account for this data point, make it quite different from the reference distribution. If you do an ensemble refinement, which is a reweighting of, of the entire configuration space, as, as you probably uh, will have guessed, uh, it's a much more gentle change to the conformational distribution. Uh, it uh, effectively rescales one of these uh, peaks uh, scales it down and it rescales the other of the peak, which in this case scales it up, that is closer uh, to, to, to the observable. And that's the difference between ensemble and, and a single copy refinement. And the last uh, uh, a few, uh, just uh, maybe two minutes or so, I want to give you some idea of, of, of also how, how we are using this in practice. Uh, and here we are looking at um, certain measurements uh, on distances in a, in a multi-domain uh, uh, polymeric uh, system. In this case, it's a, a protein that contains of, of three domains, and, and our experimental collaborators have attached uh, chemical probes, specifically nitroxide uh, groups that have unpaired electrons, so they're, they're spin active, and that uh, can be used to, to uh, our, uh, probe distances between uh, pairs of, of these uh, nitroxide uh, spin labels in a multi-pulse electron paramagnetic resonance experiment. So the observations that come out of these um, experiments are, are indicated here. These are these modulation curves. And so the, the question is, if given a, a number of these observations uh, for, for different spin labels, can we say something about the structure uh, of this molecule? And one of the problems that one faces in turning um, observations of this kind into structure is that the spin labels, these nitroxides, are not um, uh, uh, directly attached to the protein, but they are connected by uh, short, but still uh, uh, significant flexible linkers, and they, that gives the system uh, uncertainty, configurational space uncertainty. So the question was, can we reduce that configuration space uncertainty in a way that we can account for the conformational changes or the conformations of, of this protein? And the, um, that uh, gives me a chance to address one question that, that you might have had that I also pointed out at the beginning. How do we determine this parameter theta uh, that showed up in, in, our, in our prior that we really have no good way of uh, setting a priori. And the way it is determined in, in practice, and uh, again, I would be open for, for suggestions here, uh, is the best way we found is, is in, in a, what is called an L uh, uh, curve analysis, effectively a plot of uh, the chi-square uh, uh, versus the entropy associated with with uh, changing the weights in configuration of our configuration space on so it's the kullback leibler diversion. You can see that a very small change in, in, in the weights is sufficient to, to give you a large improvement in chi-square. If you change the weights further, your chi-square barely changes. Effectively, you're starting to overfit uh, 
uh, your ensemble because you have very many degrees of freedom. And uh, if we do that for our many different uh, um, positions uh, in, in the protein, we can uh, uh, not only get distances, but also get distributions of, of these labels in space and learn something about the motions of these uh, proteins uh, in solution and uh, substantially improve the, the distance resolution that you would have otherwise. And with that, uh, I want to wrap up my presentation. So I presented to you a, a Bayesian formulation of uh, ensemble refinement uh, in which I started from a, 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 a prior distribution that, that uh, is given uh, by uh, a reference uh, model, for instance, a molecular simulation for energy surface, and then uh, introduce the posterior functional as a probability of probabilities that was then variationally optimized to make the problem more tractable and gave us a, uh, a posterior, uh, sorry, that gave us a, a probability, an ensemble distribution in a, in, in a self-consistent manner and that uh, 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 correct the Boltzmann distribution that we have in our reference distribution. And um, what is appealing about this approach is that it accounts fully also for possibly correlated statistical and systematic errors in, in both data and, uh, and observables. And uh, uh, the at least from my perspective, uh, there was also a certain level of unexpected uh, beauty emerging from this in particular that the, um, the balance between data and, and, and prior uh, became evident in this mechanical or pseudo-mechanical equilibrium for the, in the generalized uh, forces. And what is also appealing is that uh, Max and methods such as the one, particularly the one I should say, by Gall and Daniels, uh, emerge as, as special cases of this uh, more general uh, procedure. And with that, I want to stop and uh, uh, first uh, thank uh, Jürgen, who is back here. He is really a key driver of, of this work and uh, uh, also the other people who contribu contributed at various stages, including uh, Katrin for the for the deer uh, uh, analysis. And I also want to thank you for staying around, and I will try to answer questions you might have. Thank you.